feel pretty good about that drive. One thing Bees did to himself, he, he's comfortable with punting right now because he was able to hold Squeezy to three on the last possession. So as long as you don't let up a touchdown here, you're still in decent, good, decent uh -oh. shape. Oh, what stick work? Where did stick work go? Oh! Where did stick work go? Oh! oh, my God! Oh, my God! Oh, my goodness! Oh, my goodness! Oh, my goodness! What's up guys? My name is Cody. That was a video from Madden 25 that you just saw and uh, I want to talk about this guy right here um, and you may have never heard of him. If you're new to Madden, maybe, you, maybe you're just recently getting into the game. You may have never heard of him. Now real quick, before we jump into any of this, I want you to know that normally what my channel focuses on is tips and tricks to get better in Madden. So we try to share offensive and defensive things that you can do to get better at this game. Now, we will be getting into that in this video. There's going to be a ton, and I mean a ton, of little tips and tricks that you're going to pick up on through the course of today's video. But I want to give you a little bit of a backstory, and I thought this would be just kind of fun. I wanted to get your take on this. It's been an idea that I've been throwing around a little bit, and I want to give you the backstory. Now, we'll get into the tips in just a second. Now, if you want daily tips and tricks, um, I do post videos every single day on YouTube at 2 o'clock, at 4 o'clock, at 6 o'clock, and at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. I also live stream every night at 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. And if you have Madden questions or you want to be a part of my text message membership, which gives free schemes every single week to you that people use in tournaments, um, my number is in the top left-hand corner of your screen. Now, I want to give you the backstory to this. Now, be you tweezy at this time. This is the Mutt Invitational. Now, this was before the MCS. I mean, this was right when the MCS was kind of starting to become a thing. And this was PS3 to PS4. So we just went from PS4 to PS5, right? Um, this transition that you're watching was in this Madden 25 season. We went from playing on PlayStation 3 or Xbox um, 360 to playing on Xbox One or PlayStation 4, okay? Um, so just so you can kind of get a little bit of context, that's what's going on. And this Mutt Invitational, at least in my opinion, I think in the general as a community's opinion, this was the, I think this, if I remember correctly, this was the most money you could win in a tournament other than underground tournaments at the time. So this was the big Madden tournament, right? Um, I've shown a, recently a video on uh, Problem, uh, talking about Problem Right when he won the Virgin Gaming uh, Challenge, which I believe that was his last championship, Madden championship, and it was in 2013. Um, this was the year after that, okay? And this is when things were kind of starting to come back a little bit and the competitive community was starting to come back. So um, Tweezy's going to end up winning this game. And I honestly couldn't find any film of the actual game. I could just find this uh, one little putt return. But what, what Tweezy was really, really good at, um, he was really, really just a lab rat. I mean, this guy studied the game for hours and hours and hours. And he since, I think, moved on from the Madden community. But there's a lot that we can learn from him. And I want to share a video that he and I actually recorded. This one, I was probably, gosh, I I think I was t maybe, maybe, tw maybe 19 years old, maybe. Um, I was I was a lot younger. Um, this was five years or five or six years ago. And the reason I want to share this with you is because I'm thinking about bringing this back, but I'm thinking about bringing it back a little bit of a different way. And I want to know what you guys think about potentially starting a podcast for the channel um, and it, but really what I want to focus on is again, my channel is all about getting better. That's what I want to do. I want to get better at this game. And if you're a part of my channel, I think you want to get better at this game too. Um, and that can mean a lot of different things, but at the core, we want to be bet more. We want to score more points, win more games. We want to stop people. Um, we want to be the best Madden player we can be. And so, um, that's kind of the focus that I would take with the podcast is basically uh, doing something like this. So uh, anyways, I'm going to jump over to the podcast. I, I will jump in uh, throughout this video and kind of give some perspective, um, maybe some thoughts on the tips as they come. But I thought it would just kind of be fun to listen to this episode uh, of the podcast. This was a podcast that I, I, mean, I didn't make it that far with it. Uh, obviously, if I start one now, it will go the distance. I really believe that uh, because I'm very, very committed to the channel. We've uh, been very consistent in Madden 21, which has been awesome to be back in the game. But um, just let me know what you think about this. If you have questions, you can always text me. If you need setups, you can always text me. I'm going to jump over to the podcast here um, really, really quickly for you guys. So let me X out of this. This was our original interview. This was with B.U. Tweezy. I did this. This is uh, 
it's about an hour conversation about Madden. So I think it's a, I think it'll be really cool for you guys. Um, and maybe you can make fun of how uh, I sound so much different or, or, or whatever now. So uh, anyways, jump, I'm gonna jump into the video and uh, check this out. What is going on, Madden NFL fans? Welcome to the the fifth episode. Now we're getting up here on these episodes, guys, of the Hard Knocks podcast where we teach you how to take your Madden gaming career to the next level by interviewing successful tournament gamers who have developed their game into some of the best in the community. Guys, today's podcast, we're talking all about Madden 15, how to get better at Madden 15, and how to become that tournament-level player that I know you all want to become. We have a really special guest coming on today, guys, and uh, you guys probably read it on my post. If you guys follow me on Twitter, um, this guy, in my opinion, is the player to watch. Uh, for Madden 15, uh, the winner of the Mutt Invitational PlayStation 4, uh, BU Twizzy. Thanks for coming on the show, man. How the heck are you doing today? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here and just talk some Madden. Yeah, man. Love talking Madden, and I, I really can't wait to talk about it with you. I've said it all year, you know, uh, ever since the Mud Invitational, man. Just the way you talk about the game, the way you, that the speed at which you say it, it's like me, you know. When you get excited about something, you start talking about it really, really quick, and I just picked up on that watching, like, them interview you after the game. I mean, the way you wanted to point stuff out, the way you wanted to, you know, really, you know, try to get it all out is you, you had all that excitement and energy into you, and uh, that's something I can really identify with because that's, uh, kind of my same kind of mentality. Uh, but real quick here, uh, some of the guys may not know who you are. Uh, some of the guys may not uh, kind of uh, – obviously, you're, you're newer to the competitive scene. Uh, so if you could just give us a little bit of a background as to kind of your career path, what led you to become the player that you are today? Uh, yeah, so I started um, – they kind of talked about it a little bit in the Invitational. I started in Madden 13 really late. Um, I started around Easter of Madden, like Madden 13, so – kind of when the year was winding down a little bit. Um, I just kind of uh, had walked around my dorm room, had some close friends that really liked Madden, and I uh, kept playing them, and I just didn't understand why I wasn't winning, why I was doing all these picks and things like that. And uh, I just kind of decided that this is something I wanted to pursue and uh, get good at. And it was more just for competition purposes uh, to feed my competitive side against these guys that I was playing. And as it grew, I started realizing that they weren't very much competition for me anymore. Um, I started taking it online, and I would play... I played Mutt because that's what they all really played. And I did head-to-head -head a little bit, too. I had a decent record on Madden 13, but it was nothing crazy. Um, it was mostly just looking up YouTube plays, uh, stock fades, 4-3 over plus, Mike Sam 3 same A gap, just things that a lot of people knew. And I just I realized in, in Madden 25 I wanted to take it to the next level when it came out. So I played current gen a lot. I think uh, my Mutt record on there was about 600 wins and 70 losses on there. And, but it really wasn't anything great. I had like three or four plays that I thought were pretty effective and a one decent blitz out of there that it was something that I was having fun with, but it, when Next Gen came out, I decided that this is what I'm, this is what I just want to be really competitive I want to be good. And I just didn't stop until that happened and I mean, just found the buck sweep and fell in love. <laughs> Definitely agree with you, man. That's kind of a similar, uh, that's really a, a similar way that I kind of came on the scene. Um, you know, it was, it, it was the idea that I wanted to be good at the game. And so what I did, I literally, like you said, uh, subscribed to every Madden commentator in the business in Madden 13, or um, in Madden 12, tail end of Madden 12, beginning of Madden 13. Uh, literally, I would go home from work or from school, and I would, cram I would flip on the game while the game was loading up. I had to watch... Uh, Madden Tips, uh, Quick Tip of the Day, or uh, Madden TV, uh, or something like that. Watch that. Uh, try to digest as much content as possible. I literally, I think I actually, I bought a lot of eBooks. I bought some guides, and uh, but it was all around. You know, I, I just want to see what they're doing. I just want to see what they're doing compared to what I'm doing. And it was all around that kind of competitive aspect, uh, trying to grow my skill level. Ended up somehow, some way. Uh, I got an email that Mad Tips was streaming, live streaming, and so I went ahead and went over and checked out a live stream. I don't even know that I knew what a live stream was at that point. I mean, that's how little I knew about the online world in, in, in general. So I came over there. I made a, it said to uh, order to view this, you got to make an account. I made an account, logged into my name here, started watching Gibbs playing, and Gibbs asked the chat, he's like, you know, hey, does anybody want to come on and uh, play us in a game, and I was like, oh, let me play, let me play, let me play, and this was, you know, I mean, I was a senior in high school, you know, I 
all I cared about was getting to play on the internet. I didn't even quite realize who I was playing. And um, anyway, ended up playing pretty well. Ended up winning like 40 to 21. And uh, from that point on, it was kind of like a switch turned on. It was like, you know, if you really want to be good at this game, you can really do it. Uh, I mean, look what you just did to one of the best players in the Madden community, and that wasn't even after getting hardcore involved. Well, how be how much better do you think you could be? Now, at the time, obviously, you think that it's a big deal. You just beat S. Gibbs. And then, of course, now, uh, now that I know what I know now, uh, you know, looking back, obviously, it wasn't that big of a deal at the time. It wasn't like it was... You know, it wasn't like it was for money. It wasn't like he was actually probably even trying as hard as to play. But it was that little affirmation that I needed to get me involved in the community. And from there, my competitive juices took it the rest of the way. And, uh, it, you know, for me, it's not about it's not about being – it's not about winning a tournament. It's not about, um, you know, beating S. Gibbs or uh, any of those guys. You know, all it's about doing is getting better. It's all about – it's all about getting better. It's all about making myself a better player at this point. You know, at this point in Madden 25, I don't I don't give a crap if I win or lose. All I care about is getting better for Madden 15. And when Madden 15 comes out, then that's, you know, I'm kind of prepping. You know, that's going to be the, the opportunity for me to really try to hopefully push myself as a player and get a lot better at the game. But, uh, you know, I love your story, and I can identify a lot with it. Uh, but real quick here, uh, I guess my – you said you took it onto the online uh, community, and uh, Next Gen Madden was kind of where you kind of took it to the next level, if you will. Um, and I guess what I'm getting at here is once you got involved that deep, once you found out that you could be that good, how did you go about preparing for competition uh, with those uh, elite gamers? Um, so, especially for the My Invitational Tournament, um, any sort of – and this is – different than a lot of people would uh, prepare for just like an online game or something. Any sort of information I could find, I was watching it, I was studying it. I had two games of game film for D Beavers before uh, the finals. I don't know if I told him that or not, but I did. Um, Too Nice was the first person I played, and he posts YouTube videos all the time. I watched almost every video I could between when I knew that and then. Um, but it just, it comes down to refinement of what you're doing, and playing a lot of games and getting a lot of different looks from a lot of different people. Um, I have a lot, I mean, I have a lot of games logged between um, Gen 3 and Gen 4 this year. And when you play that many games, uh, you're going to find people running all different types of stuff. And you'll find what stops you and what doesn't, what you like to play against and what you don't. And once you find your weaknesses and your holes, you can sort of start to correct that. So earlier in the year when I found Buck Sweep, that formation, I, I literally only just ran the ball. I didn't know how to pass out of it. I didn't know I could run a read option against 3-4 solid. I didn't know anything. And I would lose some games because I didn't realize what I, what I could do other than that. So it comes down to refinement of your skills and opening up your strategy because you want to play the best players. So I started streaming, and I would take challenges from everybody before the – like challenges from anybody before the finals, um, regardless of who they were, just simply because I wanted to play the best players because you can't get better unless you're playing competition that challenges you. So I wanted the people who were going to stop the buck sweep to make me have to pass the ball, which eventually won me the, the game because I didn't really run the buck sweep very much. I ran maybe four or five times for positive yardage. That was anything worthwhile that was more than one to two yards. That's a great point, man, and I really want to bounce off that because, uh, you know, I've been talking about you for a couple weeks now, and uh, some of the feedback I've gotten is uh, – you know, he only wants buck sweep or he only does this. And I feel like that's a common criticism that everybody's going to give to anybody that has success. But let's take a look uh, real quick here. This is kind of what I want to do with this show specifically because uh, I got the opportunity to interview you. Uh, real quick, I want to uh, – we're going to get back to these players in just a moment. But real, real quick, I, I just want everyone at home to kind of think about this. In Madden 13, the Madden Challenge Virgin Gaming Series uh, winner was Problem, Argu uh, not even arguably the GOAT, the greatest player of all time, uh, undisputed, three Madden Challenge titles, a phenomenal player, and a consistency at its finest. Now, what did he do on offense? He ran bunch quads, and he put them on a fade or a streak and a drag. It was basically Pat's will drag from a spread formation. It's the same thing that everybody did all year. What did he do on defense? He ran 4-6 bear under, sent 6, got 2 free. Basically the same thing that everybody else did in the tournament. 
what did he do in Madden uh, 08, or I think it was, I want to say it's 08, it's either 08 or 10, I can't, I sometimes get the years mixed up, but he ran stink pinch every single play on defense, all right, let's take another example, Warhawk, arguably one of the best, most consistent players in the last two, three years, kind of, you know, I haven't heard from much, much from him this year, but last year and the year before that, uh, really good uh, showings in the Madden Challenge, what did he run? Pats will drag. He actually ran the play. Pats will drag. And uh, you know what do you do on defense? What do you do defensively? You know a lot of that four three over plus basic edge pressure concepts. You know send six get two free. The same mentality that problem had. What this year? What did S Gibbs run on defense on current gen? The big nickel bear because the big nickel bear was able to get pressure and it wasn't just able to get pressure, it was able to get really fast pressure at the quarterback, and you only had to send six guys. But he basically ran crash three every play. A guy like Zan, we want to knock the buck sweeps of the community like Tweezy, but we don't want to think about the fact that Zan, who most people would say is a top-tier player and, and a pretty good individual himself, and I obviously, obviously uh, you know, I think that all these players are great players. I think that all these players are good for the community. But Zan on X-Gen Madden, it was buck sweep. It was inverted veer. It was that kind of an offense. It's the same style of attack that Tweezy has. So I guess I, I guess what I'm getting at is sometimes I, I struggle with people who kind of uh, pinpoint tournament players and try to call them out because they only run one play. When in reality, if you would have watched the game as we, you know, as I did this morning and I did of course live on uh, that Friday evening. You know, it wasn't buck sweep. Buck sweep was, you know, it was four yards. It was the threat of buck sweep that opened up the passing game. But it was the, like he said, like he said just a second ago, it's the it's the ability to refine, 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 refine. You know, problem on the streaks and fades. Obviously, he had the streaks and fades, but he also had the playmaker drag. He had the, you you know, the QB scramble that he could do. He had a whole plethora of other plays that he could have gone to. Uh, we, you know, every now and then in Madden 13, you would see him go to the gun empty giant and do the tight end streaks from there. You know, different having the ability to adjust is something that people like Tweezy and people who are in the spotlight don't always get their credit for, but I think that it's a huge uh, it's a huge mistake by the spectators. And could you talk a little bit about uh, you know your ability to adjust and the importance of the ability to adjust as a tournament player? Yeah, so um, especially in this day and age of Madden, and I can't really I say that like I've played for 10 years, but I really haven't. But um, from all the stories that I've heard and all the things with shake blitzing in the past and nanos and all these things, just unstop or rocket catches, um, just unstoppable things. And you rarely find that this year. I think I could count on my like count on my hands how many rocket catches there are, nanos that I don't think exist anymore. Um, and so when you come up against these high-level competitors, they're going to find a way to stop what you're doing eventually with enough practice and knowing unless you just hop in a game with them and they've never seen you before, you might catch them a couple times, um, but they're going to eventually adjust. So you have to have the counter to their adjustment. So the reason that I did the fade on the left, to stop Buck Sweep, you can't just run, you can't run man because and man does stop that fade. If you have a man, up, man press, you're not going to throw that fade ever. So you have to go zone against it, and that fade... Oh, those outside fades have been pretty popular this year with a lot of people, and they destroy zone. There are a couple things you can do to try and slow them down, but if you have the right reads and the right other routes to, uh, to be a combo to your fade, it's going to be very tough to stop. I know I've, I've laughed with Gibbs until about 3 or 4 in the morning, literally in practice mode, after we played a couple games. And he was trying to figure out a counter to both of those things, and it, it wasn't consistent by any means. And, I mean, Gibbs is one of the best people at labbing defenses and labbing counters to anything that people are doing. Um, and I know even he was uh, having problems with it. So for preparing in these tournaments, you don't want to necessarily just make the most complex 70-play scheme that you have. You can make it two to three formations that are just hell to stop and just make it so that the opponent knows what you're going to do but literally just can't stop you, just can't even contain you. And that, if you can do that to somebody, you're going to win so many more games than just having the most fancy scheme that you can imagine. 1,000% agree with you, man. All right, guys, I wanted to jump in here just for a second, and I wanted to um, – I just wanted to talk about what, what the point that I just made was and why I believe it was so significant uh, at the time, and it has stood the test of time. Essentially what we just talked about was the – 
Um, the bottom line reality that, you know, there's a finite number of plays. This is why I like the Colts offense so much because what the Colts offense was able to do is they were able to run a finite number of plays and they fit really well together. You might have heard him reference a couple of different names, right? Um, and I want to talk about some of the tournaments that have happened since then. Um, in Madden 15, and I might get some of these tournament tournament champions uh, wrong, but um, but but Stiff Meister, or, or, I remember Stiff from uh, at the time. I think he was with Madden Daily's crew, and he was labbing with Lights Out. He probably still does. Now he's with Huddle GG. But if you remember anything about Stiff Meister, you'll remember that this guy was running single back tight. Uh, I believe it was tight flex, and it might have been out of the Rams playbook. It might be out of another playbook. I'm pretty sure it was tight flex um, out of the Rams playbook. He ran that formation very consistently, and he ran um, – there was a, a – I believe it was called halfback wheel, um, and I think it was also the off tackle out of that formation. He ran that formation consistently and was able to ultimately win the championship. And Madden, uh, you know, and we could go on and on for, for days here about how much respect I have for Michael Skimbo and how I believe – you know, I obviously believe that Michael Skimbo is, is – is, if he's not the best player uh, of all time, he's definitely right there. Um, and obviously he started streaming again, but, I mean, you think about what Skimbo did on offense. Ran gun bunch every single play, and within gun bunch was running, you know, really a combination of three to five plays um, that he was using. Here's what you got to understand, uh, and what I really feel like uh, the point that was just made in the video, and you can literally go down the list. Like if you think about it, um, Madden 19 was a very similar story. Uh, Madden 19, it was the nickel 335 odd uh, pressure, right? In Madden 20, it was the dime 146 pressure. If you remember watching Joke. Uh, a lot of what he did was out of the dime 146 damage, and then as well um, with Decroft. Decroft ran, you know, gun tr gun Y off trips pats or gun U trips, um, and it got him all the way to the final uh, the finals of the Madden Bowl. Um, you know, you take a look at Henry. Henry runs bunch every single play, and then he obviously uses dime 146. Here's what I'm trying to get at, and 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 obviously the people that have been winning um, so far consistently in Madden 21 have basically kind of come with the same formula. With, with pro players, and, and really if you want to be elite, what you have to be able to do is you have to be able to, and I've, I've talked about this a million times um, in the past, but I haven't talked about it a ton recently, this idea of having a power play and a counter play. A power play being a play that forces your opponent to have to do a very specific adjustment to be able to stop it. So, for example, the way that I do it, and, and I'm a little bit more simple, um, it could be as simple as a curl flat concept in Madden 21. It doesn't have to be this elaborate, glitchy thing, right? Um, at the time, what, what Tweezy is referencing, Buck Sweep, there, there was an ability to run gut, butt, or, uh, Buck Sweep, I believe from Trey Open. It might have been Wide Trips, but I'm pretty sure it was Gun Trey Open. And you could run Buck Sweep uh, where you had two pulling guards, and it was really hard to stop it. You ba Like he said, you basically couldn't run man coverage against it. And so what people would have to do to stop it is they would have to call zone coverage. The problem is if they call zone coverage, that opens them up for this little snap throw uh, fade route that Tweezy would use or catch, right? I remember practicing with him, and he did that to me over and over again, right? Um, the bottom line reality is this. You want to have a strong play that you can establish that you can execute. So it could be a simple, like for me, in Madden 21, it's very, I mean, if you're watching the Peyton Manning series, um, that's pretty much the way I like to play. Um, I really like that offense. It's the offense that I feel most comfortable in. It's the offense that I have labbed for years and years and years and years. It may not be the most effective. It may not be the most potent and powerful. But for me, it works really, really well um, just because I like the way that the play reads and goes together. So what I'm getting at here is um, I have that play, and there's a very specific defense that they're going to have to call to stop that play, right? So maybe uh, if I'm thinking off the top of my head, if I'm running levels and I'm running two in routes basically from the left side to the right, and then I have a curl flat concept, I know that they're going to have to have a curl flat zone to stop the curl route, right? Uh, but it can't be zone dropped. Um, and then I also know that, so, so in essence, they're going to have to play cover three stock, you know, with probably deep halves of the outside guys to be able to stop this. Okay, let's just say that. Cover three Mabel stock with a good user in the middle of the field. But they, the purple zones can't be at 20 yards. They have to be at, at, at uh, a stock depth. So what that means is maybe a counter play to levels uh, divide is something like uh, slot cross, right? Because that crossing route is now going to get over the purple zone. It looks exactly the same, but it goes in a different direction and forces the defense to call a different type of defense. 
That's what I'm talking about. And that's what these guys are talking about. So I just wanted to interject there and kind of share that. And obviously, um, this has stood the test of time uh, and kind of point out some of the things. And, and obviously, we could go back and look. But you'll find, if you look at the MCS over the last um, six years uh, after this video was posted, um, you will see that that principle that we just broke down is is very, very true. And interestingly enough, it's also very, very true in the real NFL. It's also really, really, really true with the air raid offense, which is one of my favorite new things that I've been uh, creating. And if you want to pick up the air raid ebook, that link is in the description. But what I'm talking about with this is air raid was all about execution. Air raid's all about execution. Um, how mummy when he was when he was first, um, I believe it was Jackson State that he was coaching. I mean, I, I'm trying to remember the exact school's name, but I think, I'm pretty sure it was Jackson State, um, a college uh, football team. And what they did was they ran mesh like literally 30 times in a game, and um, that because that's their power play. That's the play, you know, it, it always comes back to this phrase uh, of Lombardi where he says, gentlemen, this is the play that we must make go. This is the play that we will make go. And this is the play that we will run again and again and again and again. That's the same concept, the same principles from arguably the best football coach that have ever that's ever lived applies to Madden and applies to this in a very real way. So anyway, let's jump back into the episode and, and, and keep uh, and keep moving along here. real quick uh probably talk about this a little bit more uh than i wanted to but um you know my biggest my biggest problem is sometimes i get a little bit i get a little bit uh you know antsy and you know i don't want to do buck sweep because everybody runs buck sweep or i don't want to do the fades because everybody runs the fades so i i develop my own kind of thing uh but like you said you know it's not necessarily about the scheme you know the you know, every year you got you got plays that work. You know, for example, uh, ah, shoot, I can't even remember. I can't remember the exact quote. Uh, so this is going to be a paraphrasing quote. Uh, but basically, this was the problem with Tom Larringer when he first started coaching the Dallas Cowboys. Was he wanted to make everything so complex that it would work against any defense in the game? But the quarterback wasn't able to read it by the time the the pressure because you because here's the thing you can't simulate in-game comp competitive juices. You can't simulate, uh, you know, that that pressure, that you know, that heavy pressure that defenses are going to be sending at you. So you have to have the, arguably, you have to have the most simplistic offense as possible to give you the maximum ability to read the defense. Because if you could read the defense out of Tom Landry's system, then you would beat every defense because the plays were set up to beat every defense. But the reality is, for the quarterback to look on all the way to the right, then all the way to the left, then all the way to the, then come back to the middle. It's it's just a lot of a lot of different nuances that you're going to have to do. And so one of the things that I, I think I take from you there was as you're going about preparing for your scheme, as you're going about preparing for competition, you try to find you know a couple of plays, but you run them with perfection. You know what beats them, you know what doesn't beat them, and that is how you make a read. I know a lot of people criticized you for running the fade against off coverage and the buck sweep against man coverage, but that was a read, and it may sound like a very simple read, but it was an effective read that obviously had results. Yeah, so, and I mean, I just go back to the um, third and 13 call buck sweep to that eventually that won me the championship. Um, that was just, I saw the guys were pressed up against them. It wasn't 3-4 solid because the guy was lined up directly over Dan Deardorff, and I just, I had to run it. Just yeah. once you once you develop that sort of confidence, you just, you make those on-the-fly decisions, and that's what separates you. Yeah, man. I was. Well, I really hope that uh, you talk a little bit more about this. You just said. Uh, I love what you just said there. You know, once you have that confidence, once you have that uh, that consistency, one of the things that I guess I struggle with a little bit, and I don't, I overthink a lot of things. I tend to overanalyze. I tend to over critique myself, especially. And um, so one of, for example, one of my offenses I've been running, I've been running all year, was Arizona. And so I was running Arizona. I was running the spread, and then. If I got a press read, I would go and Ted the type formation. If I got a off coverage read, then I would adjust off that, and it was all basically revolving around where the defenders are, so that I could attack. So, for example, if you're base aligned, then I'm going to go to this play, or if you're man aligned, then I'm going to go to this play, or if you're, you know, if you're pressing, then I'm going to go to this play. And all these different reads off of one another, all this progression. It's a really good off, in my opinion. It's really effective. It's really good. It's consistent. 
Uh, but the problem was, I ended up playing in a very laggy game one time uh, in a mutthead tourney, and I hadn't played all day. It was my first game of the day. I wasn't really kind of... I just wasn't at my, my peak performance. Ended up playing somebody I should have beat. Got lagged, and I got tackled by my offensive tackle like three times in the game. The offense was fine. There was no real problem with it. The problem was was when I got stopped, it was almost like at the most inopportune times, you know, the, the fourth and five, I ran, I got tackled by my tackle, you know, or the, you know, things like that. And so I ended up being seven to three, and I lost. And the, the only thing that I felt like I, I felt like I should have won was I had, like, second and goal from the two, and I have this play uh, that I post on my YouTube channel, I think. It's basically in route, so you can get a spectacular catch animation from the smart route, from the stock smart routed in routes in the red zone inside the five. And uh, anyway, for whatever reason, <laughs> for whatever reason, uh, my guy decided to stop running the in route, and I, I didn't even need the spectacular catch. I mean, he was wide open. Ended up stopped running, didn't, didn't catch the ball. That was the game seven to three. I lose. And I guess from that point, I don't know what happened, but something in me said you have to switch because the Arizona playbook doesn't have that goal line scoring option that I felt like I needed, even though it does, even though it has the single back ace, the snap throws eggs, the simple plays that we can use. But for me, I guess I, like I said, I overanalyze. I always want that, that, you know, that cue play that, that money, not that really, not even that money play, but just the, uh, you know, just that, that unique play that, you know, you feel you, that makes you stand out. And uh, so anyway, I switched, I switched to Atlanta. And I was running the bunch, and I, I, you know, I mean, I could run the bunch. The only problem with Atlanta is I wasn't comfortable uh, running the bunch consistently. I've been running the spread, so you, the way you read the defense out of a bunch is way different than the way you would read it out of a spread because there's different tells, there's different uh, strengths and weaknesses to different. Anyway, so I come out in the in the bunch, and I ran. I was running Z spot, but I run it. A, I, I run it a special way. And it's it's pretty effective. Now that I've played with the book more, I know how to run it. But this was literally, I mean, like right after that, I jumped into another tourney game with Atlanta, and I had ran Atlanta. I've never ran Atlanta, uh, you know. And so anyway, long story sh short, uh, I end up getting beaten that game, 16 to 14. And uh, wasn't necessarily even my offenses. I I think it was more my offensive fault than it was my defense. But anyway. You know, it's just I, mean, to, I didn't feel like I could pass the ball consistently, and I get I, sometimes I get really uh, tightly wound up, uh, really kind of uh, conservative when I play tournament games because I know that the stakes are so much higher than if you're just playing a regular game. And can you talk about kind of how you overcome uh, and kind of how you uh, get past that uh, in a tournament atmosphere? Yeah. So I mean, and I'm not even necessarily the best example. Um, in that, that last game against uh, Beavers, I had labbed three or four different different formations other than what I ran um, of passing of just straight passing plays that I thought were just going to tear up any zone that he ran at me because I knew he ran a lot of zone and uh, I was I was scared to run him and I, I mean I only had the ball two times granted because the punt return kind of took away an offensive possession but um, yeah so when you're going into those tournament games you just I I just want you just gotta stick to what you're good at. Don't don't try necessarily try to impress the other person because they're not gonna be impressed if you run all this new stuff because they never knew your offense before. They're not gonna be impressed with like, oh, he took me to overtime and I still beat him by three, something like that. It's all about at the end of the day, it's all about getting the W. And you can say like that you wanna be different, you wanna be creative, because we all wanna have that money play that no one can stop and no one else runs and no one else knows how to do it like us, but yeah, I run Buck Sweep like every, like half the Madden community, but it's it works and it's effective. And you can't let a loss or anything like that take you away from your scheme because, like you like you were saying, you had been effective with the Arizona book all year, and it sounds like you're pretty effective with the ATL book now. Um, but that one loss just because laggy game, bad reads doesn't make you a bad player. It doesn't mean that you're worse than the guy you just played. I guarantee you play him ten times. You lose. That's the one time you lose out of ten. And that's what I just want to tell you guys. If you hop in a game with, say you just hop in a game and randomly Farles or Gibbs is playing Mutt, and you get crushed, and that's just because they send nickel strong at you and you don't know how to deal with edge pressure, 
I mean, it is what it is. You just that's a learning experience. You don't quit out of that game. You're gonna learn so much more by sticking in, getting your butt whooped, than anything. Yeah, man, I love what you just said, and uh, obviously I want to clarify, uh, you know, obviously I think that what Tweezy's getting at there is not necessarily the idea that, you, you know, you, you don't want to, that you, the idea that you don't want to just keep doing the same thing over and over again if it's not working, but the idea that I, that you have success with a playbook, and this is something that Zan does, which is mad props to him, because I don't know if I'd ever be able to do this, I mean, I know I wouldn't, because I'm just so over analytical and I break down so much on my channel. I just would there'd be no possible way that I would ever do this. But what Zan does is he picks one playbook literally like now. When he goes down, plays the game at EA, uh, you know, he plays the game and gets uh, when they give feedback, he finds a playbook that he likes, starts to prepare now. Obviously, you know, something which like for you guys, you know, and, and even me, you know, we would obviously be doing this when the demo dropped. But basically, he finds a playbook that he likes and uh, just starts working and works it all year long and milks it for you know he runs it and, and even though even though it may not have that that power play or something that's that's his thing and he runs it to perfection because he develops and develops and develops and develops and develops and develops so much that he knows how to adjust and so uh, I just uh, real quickly you know I I definitely agree with you on that the idea that you know if you if you are getting even if you're getting stomped in a game, that doesn't mean you change up your whole playbook. That doesn't mean you go away from what you've been doing all year, but you could tweak it a little bit. But obviously you want to do that in practice mode when the lights aren't on you in a big tournament battle. battle. So, yeah. so I mean, don't necessarily, I didn't want to mislead anybody. If you're running uh, single back ace, half back zone weak and just getting stopped every play, I don't want you to necessarily just like, oh, I need to keep running this because Tweezy told me that I can't get away from what I'm doing. No. Make adjustments to what you're doing. If the guy's stopping you, take what he's giving you. But next game, don't assume that that guy's going to stop what the last guy was just stopping. Because no one, no one plays the game the same way as everybody else. Exactly, man. Exactly. We were just talking about that last week. Uh, we talked last week about kind of how the idea that you want to play as many. And you, you already said this. I, I, I should have echoed it then. But uh, the idea that you want to play as many people as you can possible, so that you can get as many looks as you can, uh, so that you can be as prepared as you can. So, uh, but uh, guys, all of the great players uh, in the Madden world, all the successful players, the guys that make the most success playing the game, guys like Problem. We talked about a little earlier. Guys like Serious Mo. Guys like uh, Truth and Madden 12. Guys like uh, Bro. Uh, uh, excuse me. Like I said, I already said Serious Mo. Matt in, uh, this year on current gen. Uh, guys like Tweezy on next gen. Guys like Gibbs. All these guys have that kind of trademark. Uh, that kind of something that they're known for. For example, Problem with the Bear Under. That was kind of his trademark. Serious Mo with the trips tied in was kind of his trademark. Truth with the User catching streaks in Madden 12 was kind of his thing. Uh, you know, Gibbs is kind of always having that that one play, uh, that one power play that nobody else really kind of knows until he posts it. Um, and I guess what I want to hear from you at this point in the show is, what are you best known for uh, as far as kind of what is, you know, if, if someone's in a game and they see you do this, you know, they're, they're thinking in the back of their head, you know, that's Tweezy, I'm playing Tweezy right now. Um, I mean, it's got to be the buck sweep with, especially in that with those Donald Pens out wide and Dan Deardorff in the slot. Um, but I think it's also a combination of that and the nickel two four five DT uh, three man A gap. Um, didn't get to see it much in the Invitational Finals because Beavers had it kind of locked up, and there was something I wanted to tweak with it to flip it up to the other side so that the blocking running back on the right wouldn't block on the left. It's just something that didn't pop into my head. So don't let that happen to you guys if you're in a big game. Just Kind of slow yourself down and think about what you're doing. Luckily enough, I was able to sneak away with the win without doing that adjustment. But, um, I think the defense has gotten me a lot more wins than running Buck Sweep has. Thank you, man. Uh, <laughs> I, if I could jump for joy right now and not get made fun of, I would do it. <laughs> I I agree so much with you. Um, last year, and this is uh, this is kind of my my take. Last year, I was known for running the gun bunch PA post. That was kind of my trademark. Uh, that was kind of the play that I – it was my first ever breakdown. It was my first ever, uh, you know, tip. It was, my, it, was, it was that. And it was kind of what I – it was kind of what I became known for. 
by the end of the year, I wasn't even running the gun bunch. You know, it wasn't even, and, and it really was, it, it was just more of a progression as a player. You know, I want to try out all these things, stuff like that. But uh, uh, more so on you, you know, the buck sweep is a good play. It's what you're known for. But I, like you said, and I definitely echo it, you know, it's not what makes you as good as you are. Uh, what makes you as good as you are is the ability to develop things like the nickel 245 a gap blitz uh, for me I had a similar blitz it was a two-man a gap blitz out of the 4-4 formation last season uh, it was pretty effective and I thought of, I at the time I, you know it was probably the best blitz in the game because of the coverage behind it uh, but the the thing that I'm getting at here is I wasn't really known for that and you know this year I'm not really known for 4-3 under Mike will cross a gap pressure but that's what I'm. That's what actually is going to win you the games. Yeah. The, you know, it's not necessarily the the quote unquote super power play. It's that defensive play that you have that nobody else has, and the ability to develop that is what makes you good long term. But uh, real quick here, man. Uh, obviously, we've already been talking a little bit about the Mud Invitational. Me as a uh, fan of your game. Me as a fan of Madden. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the Mud Invitational, and uh, we've already talked about kind of how you went about uh, preparing. You know, watching all the all the tape you can, watching all the watching all the scouting tape that you can, getting your hands on as much content as you can. Uh, I think that's big for anybody. Obviously, you had your scheme and your team locked in long before the tournament. I think that that's huge as well. Uh, that's something I don't always do a good job about. Uh, but real quick, man, I wish uh, really quickly, uh, I don't really want to talk about the punt return, to be honest. Uh, I think that's a little bit overshadowed. I think that's a little bit uh, blown up. I don't know if it was quite as good as, as uh, people think it was because uh, I think, you know, we both know that I think what was really effective about your game uh, was the user catch streaks and the defensive ability that you had to really kind of cage Beavers uh, in the beginning of the game that actually got you the chance for the punt return. So if you could talk a little bit about your mentality uh, going into the game defensively and uh, and a little bit offensively as well. Uh, yeah, so defensively, uh, not everybody really knew this because a lot of people had kind of – I had been streaming and I had been there had been YouTube videos posted about me, uh, some negative, some positive, um, about my luck sweep. So a lot of people knew exactly what I was going to run, but they didn't realize that he was running the exact same playbook and the exact same scheme – pretty much across the board. So I didn't have buck sweep defense. I'm glad I played Beavers in the finals. I didn't have buck sweep defense until about two weeks before the finals. I didn't want to think about it. I wanted to focus on my game. But I went in. Um, I took the Trio Sky zone that Gibbs and Farrell's run, um, and I made it a little different uh, personally where I only had to send three, and it was stopping buck sweep in the backfield for about a four-yard loss. Um, and I knew he ran strong close, and I found defense for that sending three. And I didn't know he ran single back ace. Uh, it was like ace tight or ace whatever that is in the Carolina playbook that I uh, never used. The tight, the tight slots. Yeah, the tight slots. Uh, the cutback. Yeah, with the Donald and, pins. Yeah, and he would do the cutback. And I didn't catch on until really late in his touchdown drive, and I stopped that. Um, and I really just, I, had to, I had to contain his running game because if you watch the two games that he played against the first two competitors, put up. 30, 40 points just annihilated them because they just they didn't know that he was going to run the ball as effectively and as good as he was. Um, so I knew that that's what I had to do coming in, and I thought my A gap was going to be pretty effective. And he had even talked to me that he was worried about it, but I knew he had figured something out on how to try and stop it. And he did a pretty good job. Um, there were two plays in particular where I knew exactly where he was going, and I was a step late from a just snatching him and probably ending the game there, but. I knew that defense was going to be a big deal, and I shut down his whole run game the entire game. So that's what I was aiming to do. Yeah, uh, definitely, definitely good stuff there. If you guys caught what we were saying, he had specific defenses for specific situations, and I think that's a huge thing. Uh, obviously, you know the the details behind that. Uh, you know, I don't think that those are. I don't think that those are as valuable uh, to you guys at this point in the season because Madden 25 is closing down. We're getting ready for Madden 15. Obviously, real quick, though, uh, with the Trio Sky, I'm assuming it was basically, what was it? You spread your line, crash line down, spy the DT. So, uh, Is that it? Uh, I didn't base a line so that I would keep my linebacker out 
right on that um, slot tight end or lineman, wherever you, whoever you put out there. Oh, okay. uh, I would spread and crash out because when that it wasn't and it didn't create a lot of pressure if the person would pass, but I was only sending three, so I had a lot of coverage. Um, I would spread the linebackers, yes, and I would re-blitz the outside linebacker on the right, um, and he would come in, and I could take away the middle linebacker now, so you had one person going out, and he gets double blocked, so he, he takes away two people. He takes away the tight end and the tackle. Then I had two people coming in directly eating the guards, and the guards aren't fast enough. There's no guard in the game unless you had Gene Upshaw and you didn't have him in the tournament to stop that. So that was just my own little personal thing that I labbed up. But you can, yeah, like you said, you can baseline, spread, crash down, spread your linebackers, and that's very effective setup as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, obviously, and you know, that's kind of my over analytical side. You know, I want to get into all the details, but uh, you know, definitely, I think. Uh, but I, I hope what you guys get out of this is, is you know, obviously, uh, it's it's not necessarily the specific setup that he's talking about, but it's the concept behind it. Uh, I talk about it all the time. You know, I want to teach conceptually. Uh, at this point in the season as opposed to uh, factually. And, and what I mean by that is I want to teach you guys uh, con uh, tips and things like that that carry over year to year uh, right now because uh, this is all about prepping for Madden 15. Uh, and then when Madden 15 drops, we'll get into all those X's and O details. Uh, but I th uh, obviously, you don't ever want to limit that. Obviously, that took him a long time to lab. And uh, that's the idea that I want to get at uh, really with this, uh, with this point is – the fact that you have a specific defense for a specific situation because you knew that it was going to happen, you prepared uh, for it, and you reaped the benefits later. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but that's a little bit about the mud invitational. Obviously, you know, I wanted, uh, if it was up to me, you know, I would, I would talk about that with you. I would talk about the game with you for a long time. Uh, but obviously, you know, uh, it's all about everybody else uh, who's watching this. So, uh, can you talk a little bit about? Uh, obviously, for me, I'm kind of I kind of went through this literally probably two days ago. Uh, I was playing, and, and it was this. It was what we were talking about earlier. You know, I took two really bad losses that I really was just upset with. I mean, because there was. I mean, you, you know, we've all played that game of Madden where our corners drop every pick possible, yeah. and we get tackled by our our linemen. And it's just like you're just like I beat him by 30 any other day of the week except today, and that happened to me two games in a row back to back, and it just kind of I, I literally like for like 30 minutes I sat in my chair. This is gonna sound really really uh, stupid, but I literally sat in my chair. This is how mad I was at the end of those games. I sat in my chair and I just stared at the TV. Didn't pick up the controller. Didn't go on Twitter. Didn't go on YouTube. I just stared at the TV, thinking in the back of my head. What in the world was I supposed to do? Like I was just trying to figure out something that I did wrong, and uh, it all came back to preparation. And 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 I talk about it all the time. You know, it's the, and, and we'll talk about it a little bit later in the show because I think you have a little bit of insight to this. But it's that two seconds, uh, that two seconds after the ball is snapped, that's going to define uh, how good you do in in a specific play. But uh, you know, I know for you. Uh, I'm sure that your short-lived tournament career has had some ups and downs, even as short as it's been. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the lowest point uh, that you've ever experienced in your tourna tournament career and how you kind of overcame uh, the, the, difficulty, the, the difficult times that rise up uh, when you in, get deep into the game like this? Yeah, so um, it was actually my first game in the Mud Invitational against uh, Two Nice. Um, I just was really struggling on offense. Uh, I didn't pick up on some things that he was doing. Like he was leaving a Dion Sanders out on the field, and I was running to the other side almost every time instead of running at a Dion who's going to get pancaked literally every like as soon as he gets touched. Yeah, it's like uh, forty nine tackling. Yeah, he's like. Uh, so I had I was down thirteen to three, and he had ball, and this is third quarter, two minutes left in the third quarter, and he's just driving on me, and I I'm honestly thinking it, it's a fourth and two, and he decides not to punt or fourth and one, he decides not to punt. Um, and he comes out in a not a, in not like a QB sneak like I thought he was. So I call a quick timeout. He comes back out in the same formation, and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, if he gets this, like, I, it's over. I'm not going to Florida. I'm the number two seed, and I just got knocked out on a live stream with however many, thought, like, hundreds of people, um, and it's over. And all of a sudden, I never use a free safety. I just don't do it. And I blitzed all my linebackers. He had one read that he had, and if he lobbed it over the top to his to his tight end instead of bulleting it, I'm done. I'm not here talking to you right now. 
He throws a he throws a bullet pass right to his tight end on a streak, and I come up and snatch it with Dawkins. End up taking that game. Uh, not, I think it was 19 to 13 after I got a big safety. I got a huge safety on my a gap when he was back in his own territory. Um, and so just overcoming that to making an adjustment that I wasn't necessarily comfortable with, but I knew was going to be effective against what he was doing um, is something definitely that I had to come and bounce back from because I thought I thought it was over. I was screaming. I was about to break my controller. I, it was it was not a good feeling until I turned that game around. Yeah, man, it's all about, and and that's kind of what it was for me, you know. Uh, the funny thing about uh, my my struggle uh, was I played like two games, and these were against you know subpar players. They weren't anything special, and lost both of those. I lost the first one uh, like seven to three, and the second one fourteen to sixteen. And uh, like I said, after that, I was just done. I was so mad, and uh, just literally just stared at the TV. And eventually, and this guy, uh, you know, this guy had been hitting me up, and he, he had emailed me, uh, I don't know how long ago, wanted my gamer tag, and I was like, yeah, you know what? Sure, I'm all about playing community. Obviously, at the time, I'm thinking, you know, this guy's, you know, I'm, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, I'm like, I'll probably never play this guy because I don't ever have time to play anymore, and you know, it's probably never be anything. Well, I, I get a message from uh, this guy sends me an invite to play the game. And so I'm, I'm like, I really don't want to play. I really don't want to play. For some reason, I was like, you know what? We'll just play. I don't care. We'll just play. And I played that game, the entire game, just just chilling. It, it was not intense. I didn't think of it like a tournament game. I didn't think of it like a, uh, you know, I didn't think of it. I didn't get up tight. I didn't even really, I mean, I played okay, but it wasn't like I played, like, lights out. And, uh I was trying a couple new things. I was trying this uh, motion snap, uh, user catch thing I'm working on. I was just trying some stuff like that. Anywho, uh, turns out uh, it's like um, it's like six to nothing, and I and he's running the pistol a strong power, uh, and that was kind of his his go to bread and butter. Well, the pistol a strong power was actually the play that I was struggling stopping. In the defense, uh, there's a long backstory, but basically I wasn't doing very well against Pistol Strong Power when I got beaten that tournament game. Mm -hmm. So I switched back to my bread and butter defense uh, in this game, and I had never labbed against Strong Power uh, on that specific defense because that specific defense was more of a passing situation-based defense. But I decided for the heck of it that I wanted to run it all game. Anyway, long story short, I end up going through and, and uh, basically beating him. It was 6 to it was six to seven, and I uh, could have kicked a field goal to win. But again, I'm thinking we're just playing around, so I don't kick a field goal. I was just, you know, playing around. And uh, anyway, he ends up getting the W. Come to find out, I log on to Mudhead like five seconds later. I'm supposed to confirm a score of seven to six from the guy that that it, from this guy. I didn't have any clue that he. And so me being me not wanting to be a jerk about it, I went ahead and confirmed it. Then I went back and looked at what this guy was. That the guy that I played was the top ranked player on the PlayStation 4 lobby and his record was 20 and 0. And I think that that sheds a little bit of light on kind of way I overcome it and kind of the way that you overcame it as well is the idea that you know, sometimes we get overwhelmed by all the Xs and Os and all the time we spend and sometimes I get overwhelmed by the fact that I don't want to spend all this time playing a game if I'm not going to have success with it. And so I put that much more pressure on myself to play good in those in those games. And so kind of what you were saying, kind of what I did, when you just relax, when you, you when you, you slow down and you say, okay, lock up here, let me see how I can stop this, let me stop yelling at the TV like a maniac, let me actually try to adjust and fix the problem as opposed to just making it worse by calling random defenses that I've never played before. And uh, if you could just talk a little bit about kind of what I just said there, uh, kind of expand on that if you would. Yeah, so um, in yelling at TV like a maniac, you can. Have, uh, one of my roommates was he was yelling in the house with me at the time. Uh, like I asked my girlfriend not to be there because I don't want to see her like her see me when I'm doing that kind of stuff. But I'm screaming at everything. I got I fumbled the first play of the game after a 50 yard run and I lost it. He fumbled his first play after a four yard loss and he got it back. So I'm just yelling at TV, thinking EA hates me. They obviously don't want me to go to Orlando. And in that situation right there, I literally just calmed myself down and I said, "This is like this is the game. I just just lock up, I make a huge play, I 
scream, like go down, drive, score. And it's all about just keeping your composure in the sense that I've played coin games, wager games, whatever, where I've been losing, but it's a, it's about the next play. It's not about, oh, he threw a 90-yard bomb on a Hail Mary against me and mossed me. Like, that's over. It's all about the very next play and having a short memory of whatever happened against you. And Beavers did a great, Beavers is an example of you did a great job. That's a part return that I'll, I'll never replicate again in my life. And when you're down 10 nothing like that, you, have, you see him in his interview, he's like, I'm still getting ball at half. I have all my timeouts, and I have about two minutes left. Like, it's not a big deal. He drove down, kicked three, drove down again with probably a better drive than I had to, to win the game, and got seven, and put me in an awful position where I when, where 10 minutes ago, 13 minutes ago, I was looking like I was in the driver's seat with all the momentum in the world. And it's all about that you can flip around any, any game that you're in with the right adjustments, the right composure, and the right mindset. Yeah, man, it's all about that mentality. It's all about, you know, it doesn't do you any good. It doesn't. I was saying, I, you know, you keep telling, I keep going over this. I keep talking about it, and it always seems like it, it finds its way back into my head. But it really doesn't. You know, it's that mentality. You know, it doesn't do you any good to get mad at the game. Obviously, you know, you want to have competitive juices. With, you know, we're not saying we're not saying, oh, I just got dotted for fifty. No, yeah, you know, next play, whatever. Obviously, I'm not talking like that, but you know, getting literally so mad that you're not even thinking right, you know, obviously, I think that that's what the best players do. And it kind of, as we saw, like as you just stated with your game, the way you turned it around was actually, you know, take a take a deep breath, take a timeout, calm down, and uh, you know, just make a play and stop. For people who play the game so much, it, it's not necessarily as much about thinking as it is about just playing and reacting. Uh, but one of the things that I think a lot of people get a lot of value out of with my show here is um, uh, this story of mine. So I was, like I said, when I was up and coming in Madden 13, that was kind of my year that I really played a lot, and I would say that I played about an average of anywhere from four to eight hours a day, depending on how much time I had to play the game. And I would play it, and I would play it, and I would play it, and I would play it. And I played it so much, like, it was... I, I literally, like, I could just reel off to you almost every play in the game. I mean, I was I was pretty good at Madden 13. But I think that in a, as far as a gameplay standpoint, as far as, you know, being better at the actual uh, game, being a better at uh, adjusting on the fly, being a better overall player, uh, I think I'm a better player in Madden 25 than I was in Madden 13, even though I didn't spend anywhere near as much time uh, with actually just physically playing the game Madden 25 as I have with Madden 13. So uh, I think that that's because I, I had that foundation of Madden 13, the basics I already knew coming into Madden 25, and all I had to focus on from that point was developing kind of my scheme, kind of developing my, uh, you know, my advanced tactics, uh, how to counter things, but I had the basic knowledge of the game because of all the time I spent in Madden 13, and if you could just uh, hit a little bit on how the basics transfer uh, from year to year in this game. Yeah, so um, the thing that I watched this week that I really want to touch on is Gibbs and Faro's uh, being interviewed uh, for the Scummo podcast and things like that, um, and they talk about bringing nine in the box and having a numbers advantage against the run. That's something that doesn't go away. That's just basic football knowledge, and that's when we talk about a trio sky zone eating pulling guards, this is the first year that we've kind of not necessarily the first year, but one of the few the first years that we've seen pulling guards just take over a game. And when you see those singles and all these things, those aren't gonna be things that just disappear after this year. Those are gonna be things that are around for a long time now if they keep these things in the game. Like when we talk about a curl flat being taken away by having both a flat and a buzz zone to take away the flat route and the curl. Those are things that transfer from year to year, and knowing what these what these zones stop, what man stops, it's not going to change too much unless all of a sudden, when there are some adjustments you can make next year against out routes, but if you leave the stock two man under, somebody's going to throw an out route on you almost every play unless the new computer AI adjusts it for you. So these are things that you can know, and there's backed off coverage of cover three or cover four, and press coverage is going to be cover two, two man under. It's just it's not something that changes, and that's why I think that elite players usually stay elite. Now there are some people who are just 
great at one Madden to the other, but they typically aren't just a straight bum who loses every game the next year if they were good the, the year previous. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, man. An uh, example of that is um, Tyronto, Madden uh, Challenge. He was Madden 12 Challenge winner. Haven't heard a whole lot uh, as far as he hasn't won any tournaments uh, since then. But I have heard that he's been very respectable, a uh, very good player in those tournaments. And this was coming from a guy that's got a similar, uh, not, not necessarily exact storyline that you have, but uh, a very similar one in the fact that uh, you know, he basically played the game casually uh, for the most part. Really, only did, he didn't play it anywhere near probably as much as you and I do. Uh, but the fact that he was able to adjust and he had a pretty good scheme going in uh, made him that much better. And now he's just con continuing to refine, refine, refine. Obviously, he hasn't won a tournament since then, but it's very difficult to win tournaments on a consistent basis with how many good players are out there. But it is not difficult to stay effective in the game. It's not difficult to, uh, you know, keep that kind of, uh, you know, basic uh, element of, of tournament style uh, that I think that you've developed. And I think that people that watching this show, uh, I think that hopefully if it's their desire to truly develop it, uh, that there is opportunities for that if they would only uh, just put in the time. Uh, like you said, like I've said both, you know, the amount of time that you've put into Madden 25 is uh, leaps and bounds, uh, leaps and bounds beyond uh, the amount of time that uh, you know other people have put into the game, and that's why you're so, excuse me, that's why you're so successful, and uh, that is why you know I've had some success as well because I put in some, I put in a lot of time on the game, uh, and I think that that's a huge point moving forward. But uh, one of the things that I'm really uh, most excited about with this show, and I'm really, I'm, I, this is kind of my uh, uh, mad and nerd, dumb uh, kind of trait, if you will. Um, but what I really want to ask you, and I've been excited about this ever since I watched your game, what's your what what goes through your head when you develop uh, offense and defensive schemes? What what kind of things do you look for? Uh, what are some tips that you can give guys uh, that really don't have the backdrop that you do Madden wise? How they can figure out, you know, how did you figure out that the buck sweep was so good, or how did you figure out that the fade against off coverage is so good? What was the process that kind of led you to knowing that stuff? Yeah, so we kind of touched on it a little bit um, earlier in the show, and it was all the games that I played this year. So I didn't just come on the next gen and find Magically Buck Sweep. It was actually around when the stiff arm glitch was around, and uh, people would grab an Eric Dickerson, who had probably the best stiff arm arming in the game, throw some Donald Pens out there, and you weren't stopping that. If they, if you, it was, you could have two people there, and he would stiff arm both, and he'd be gone. And I was so fed up with these people running it. And I was running the KC book, and I was running Strong Power doing the same thing, so it's not like I'm a saint. Um, <laughs> and I found this buck sweep, and I didn't know what it was, what was going on. I didn't know why it was so effective, and I just uh, hopped in practice mode the next day, and I just looked at it, and I was like, why am I getting 70 yards like, against the computer, which is a, like a basic 4-3, 2 men under. And it's some people are just great at, coming up with their own things and finding these great, like Los is a great tournament player who comes up with all of his own stuff that trips tight in the series mode runs is Los's offense exactly. Great point, uh, man. Great point. I, I, I had failed to mention that, man. Los, I haven't, I actually haven't mentioned him in a while, man. He is, he's a really good player. I, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. Sorry about that interrupting you, but yeah, just uh, that kind of hit me. Tournaments, like he, him and series mode are tough. Uh, just another level that hopefully maybe one day I can reach, but not not even close now. But um, just there's some guys that are great at finding those things, and I'm I'm much better at finding defenses than I am at finding offenses. But you can it's not stealing; it's in the game. If somebody is running something that's effective against you, you can take that. Especially if I play somebody with the Carolina book, and I can recognize Carolina like if they run the wide chip side end slot buck sweep, and they grab a play that's just killing this defense I'm running. I'm going into practice mode after the game, and I'm trying out that play for myself. Um, but then defensive-wise, uh, I really like to take away what's good this year. So I really like the nickel 245 blitz. Is It's great against the pass. It's probably my favorite blitz in the game. Obviously, that's why I run it almost every play. Um, but what people don't realize is the the where the blitzing linebacker is set up shoots through a, a pulling guard spot and eats a guard. And there's a flat zone coming down that eats another guard, and my user can go over the top and stop a strong power buck sweep. So guaranteed it's not 100% because it's user versus user, and that can get a little, t little touchy. But I've also developed a guide for other people uh, as a 4-6 where we do a lot of the same things where we're trying to 
take away out routes, curls, a lot of things that a lot of people run that are, is really effective and really angers a lot of people who don't know how to stop it was, was still creating pressure. Because I think that if you're playing somebody who's very good, unless you're dropping everyone into coverage except for one, they're going to they're gonna pick you apart pretty easily um, just with knowledge of all the routes. When, they, when you have four zones on the field and the user and they have four receivers, they're going to – they're probably going to win that battle almost every time unless you just make a nasty user play. So it's all about stopping what's effective this year because you can't just tailor your defense to creating all this pressure and then all of a sudden you have all your zones on the left and nothing's on the right and they're just hitting you with out routes all day and then you're mad because they, all they did was run out routes. It's not their fault that they're that they're beating you. Yeah. So it's all about stopping what's good. Love what you said there, man. Uh, it's not there. Uh, I, I echo that a million times over. It's not their fault that they're beating you. We talked about that last week. Uh, you know, the idea that if I have a play that beats man-to-man -man coverage and you run man-to-man -man coverage, I'm just going to win. It's not It's not EA screwing you over. It's not, you know, they could, they could make a, a game that literally looks exactly like the NFL and people would still complain. But I guess the bigger picture here is this. If you actually want to be good, you actually want to put in the time, listen to what we're talking about, listen to what he's saying. The idea that you play – this is a perfect example. Okay, so there is a uh, – out of the nickel strong, there is a play that sends two pass rushers and you can get a guy free off the left edge. However, that play is very weak against – if I was playing – for example, if I'm playing Tweezy and I want to set that blitz up, what's Tweezy going to do? He's either – you know, obviously I think his whole offense is opened up at that point – because you could throw the fade on the left because I'm in zone because you have to run it from zone, or you could throw, uh, or you could run uh, box sweep because I'm because I don't have any blitzers blitzers coming from the right side. The mentality that you're obviously it's good to find plays like that. Obviously it's good to find those power plays. I think this is something that S Gibbs echoed in our interview as well. Uh, if you guys go check that out, um, but basically the idea that you if you if your um, if your scheme A is getting beat have that scheme B, C, and D to stop those, spe those specific opportunities um, because it does you no good. I was like, I love what uh, Farrell said on TWIM. I don't know how many TWIM episodes ago this was, but I think this is just a really good point, um, and this was more of an offensive tip. But basically they were, they were saying, you know, um, you know, this guy could have 25 plays to beat two men under, but if the defense calls cover too synced, then they're screwed. The mentality that you have to you have to prepare for everything, and and, and you know, I love way I love the way you're where you're coming from with the idea that you know, okay, what is this guy doing that beat me? Let me go figure out what he's doing, and if it's something that I think that I could implement into my game, why would I not do that? If it's a seamless, if it, you know, obviously if you have to change your playbook for it or you have to change your scheme for it, then you know maybe that's not the best avenue. But the idea that okay, I'm an Arizona playbook and I run the gun spread. Who knew that the zone of seams was a good play? Oh, Z Farrells did. Look, he beat me with the zone of seams. So now what do I do? I go look at my playbook and find, oh, would you look at that? I got the zone of seams. So now what do you think I'm going to do? Well, you think if I get a man read, I'm probably running the zone of seams because it's it's that mentality. It's that mentality that you, you, you learn from your mistakes. You learn from your failures. You learn from other people. Don't be so caught up in yourself that you're closing yourself off to all this other access. I get so tired. I was reading a thread the other day. I don't even know what the topic was, but somehow it got into this big debate as to as to the fact that I am a better Madden player. I am a I am a better Madden player because I have the integrity to not run buck sweep because buck sweep is good. And I'm sitting there thinking in the back of my head, I'm like, what sense what sense does that make? You know, it's not like they're gonna give you an honorary award at the Mud Invitational because you know what? I decided that I'm not running buck sweep because that's a that's a good play. You know, if we were gonna do that, then you know, I don't even know why we practice, why we, you know, why we're even doing. The idea is to get as good as possible, and to get as good as possible, um, you know, it's essential to use the plays. Uh, for example, let me give you a quick example, and this is this is another point that I want to uh, really kind of drive home here because I think that this is gonna put a lot of that uh, that kind of crap to bed. Uh, so, for example, I know how effective the buck sweep is. Okay, and this was back in my uh, really low tournament time where I was really mad that night, that evening, and um, 
anyway, one of the games I went through and I decided, okay, I'm gonna run. I'm gonna run that buck sweep. And I'm just gonna show. I'm gonna teach everybody a lesson at how good the buck sweep is. I got beat 48 to eight because I ran the buck sweep every play. You know, and I got mad on defense, and so I just ran commit out of quarters three deep and decided I didn't care. And 48 to eight. You know, the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the results. B. Tweezy can run the buck sweep better than me. That's a fact. And it's exemplified because he has more stuff off that. Because I guarantee you that if B. Tweezy only ran buck sweep, then Beeves would have shut it down. Or if he only ran the fade, then Beeves could have shut it down. But the complementary aspect of an offensive defense scheme, what B. Tweezy is getting at is obviously you have that good play, you have that power play, but having the ability to go to something else is essential because you have to adjust what, to what your opponent is doing. Exactly. All right. So... Uh, next point in our interview, guys, I know we've been going along here. Uh, just bear with us. We only got a couple more questions uh, for Tweezy. Uh, but uh, Gary Vanderchuk, uh, a guy that I am uh, really fond of, and uh, I think that he's a great businessman, but I think that his a lot of the things that he does, it transfers into Madden. Uh, it transfers into anything you do, really. Uh, but he was being interviewed about his new book called Jab, 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 Right Hook, and uh, it's actually on the New York Times bestseller list. And they were asking him, you know, you're not really that famous. You're not really that popular. How did you sell a book that well? And so his response was, well, I sold it for nine months before it came out. The idea that he, he prepared and built relationships and, and worked towards selling the book towards the launch as opposed to launching and then doing all the work. Can you talk a little bit about uh, kind of how you're preparing for Madden 15 uh, already right now uh, in June uh, before the game is even dropped? Yeah, so um, and I just want to apologize to anybody who likes me streaming because it's probably not going to happen very re like very soon. Um, I actually just kind of taken a step back from playing all these games all the time that I really like during the year just simply because it, I get more out of it now of creating – Practice mode, going into practice mode and creating new schemes, new blitzes that I think might be effective next year. Granted, I got a little little look in at what's going to be coming out in Mac 15, and grant like and some of my stuff might still work, some of it might not. Um, but if I have all this plethora of blitzes and all these new coverage ideas and schemes and all these things, and say 50% of them work, I, I now have probably a great scheme that I can just start up against people and give them a lot of problems early on in the year and then develop as I'm going. But you can't just hop in Madden 15 and be like, oh, I'm just going to start playing games, and then I'll figure out what's effective. So Look. typically from year to year, blocking schemes are very, very similar on offense, so your defense can can sometimes well translate pretty well, and especially if you have a lot of different blitzes and a lot of different formations, you're bound to find a couple that work pretty well from year to year. Love what you said there, man. Uh, I, I really, uh, I couldn't agree with more with what you just said there. Um, so, for example, uh, last season I did a back to basic series. We were talking about, uh, you know, how you get back to the basics, how you have a zone beater, a man beater, three headed rushing tag, all that basic stuff. The way the way we play the game, uh, the idea of scheme development uh, for the game before the game dropped, and uh, so then. I uh, went through, and as I was practicing, one, the one thing I was working at getting better at was uh, post-snap reads, and this is kind of what I want to get your two cents on as well. Uh, but basically, uh, you know, the idea that you're working now uh, and reaping the benefits later, the idea, I love what you said, you know, you want to develop something now so that when the game drops, you can go, you already have something, you're rocking, you're rolling, you're playing games, and that's, and then once you get, and then you have the opportunity to play those games, like we talked about earlier, you have the opportunity to play those games because you've already uh, educated yourself in the basics of the game, so you could log on, play a game of Madden, and feel pretty confident that you're going to be able to hold your own, but what else you, you also get out of playing those games is learning more and more about the game, learning more and more about what's effective without even having to do the practice work because you've already done it uh, in Madden 25, because most of the, you know, obviously there's little nuances that don't transfer year to year, but the majority of the game does transfer, and you got to take advantage of that. But uh, one of the things that I'm personally working on right now for uh, myself and my offense and and uh, kind of things that I'm doing is getting better at the post snap read. Uh, I'm pretty, I think it's pretty easy to get good at pre snap reads. I think it's pretty easy to, you know, tell tell, uh, you know, after the play is over, tell what happened. But during the play, actually reading the defense and, and the idea that 
uh, the, the defining moment in a game is the two seconds after the ball is snapped. The two seconds that defines whether you are getting sacked, whether you're going to scramble, whether you're going to throw a pick, or whether you're going to dot your opponent. Those two seconds are essential, and they define the game, in my opinion. And I think that that is the only thing. Um, I think that that is the only thing right now that I am really uh, strong in because I put so much work into it, and I think that that's kind of the thing that has saved me uh, throughout the year, uh, actually being competitive because I have such a good understanding of, of different keys. You know, I can tell you, I could tell you, like, like you have the snap the ball, the ball hits the quarterback. By the time the ball hits the quarterback, in my opinion, you should know the basic shell. You should know whether it's a cover three or cover two, two men under, whatever it is. And then what I've been doing a lot as well is getting better at reading specific points on the field as opposed to receivers. So like I'll look left, and by looking left, I'll be able to see three or four receivers. And what I'm more so looking at than looking at the receivers is looking at where the defense is. So for example, if you're in a cover three, you have the two flats, you have the two hooks. So I'm going to look, I'm going to see, okay, there's only one guy on the left side of the field. So now I know, okay, well, I have on my play, I have this corner route that goes to the left side. So I know that that's the read that I want to hit. But I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't put in so much time at working at that two seconds. And uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, kind of what you think about that? Is is that a is that a decent uh, point, decent mindset to have? Uh, something that is is kind of big on development uh, as far as long term. Uh, kind of you know, obviously for the tournament community, it's a it's even tougher with all the exotic adjustments that you can make pre snap and and all the different shells that you could throw at somebody and you could really mess with somebody's head. Um, you know, you could drop cover two out of a cover four look. You could drop cover four out of a cover two look. And uh, just I guess I, I'm getting at here is, you know, kind of hit a little bit on what I just said about the two second post snap, uh, you know, defining process of the game. Yeah, I definitely agree a lot with that. I think that, um, yeah, like you said, anybody can make those pre snap reads if you just if people tell you that backed off coverage is a certain shell and press coverage is going to be something like one or two options, you can make those reads pretty easily. But um, what separates top-level players and what separates people who are struggling and just winning games and losing games every now and then, just kind of just going with the flow, is those re is those post-snap reads. Because out of my pl uh, play-action tight end wheel out of Carolina, which is my favorite passing play, I'm looking at the right side, and I ha it's a play-action, so it kind of zooms into the quarterback for a second. And when that starts to when that animation is done, I've seen the right side of the field, and I know exactly where I'm going. Or I've seen that it's man press, and I know I'm going to my unbumpable in on the left. And I've also seen, because it's very popular now to drop your D lineman into coverage, you have to look for those sorts of things to where you see the, all these zones in the field. You don't see a linebacker who is playing an end lurk in a curl to flat, and he picks you and goes to the house. Like, it's all these things that those post-snap reads are the most important thing in the game when you're passing hands down. You can't just... You obviously have to know your routes and everything like that, know your hot routes and everything that you just did. But if you don't make a read, if they do a disguise cushion and their yellows are dropping 10 yards deeper than they normally would, and you try and throw that Z-spot post, you get lurked and you just you might have lost the game. You gave them an extra possession that they didn't deserve because you didn't make your correct read and know what you're supposed to go to. Yeah, man, that's a great point. Uh, that. And that's that's really what I want to drive home. I mean that that is um, obviously that's top level. Obviously that's hard. Uh, I'm not trying to say that any of this is easy. I'm not trying to uh, put on a front and act like you know Tweezy did this by watching some YouTube videos and you know staying up a couple nights playing some Madden. You know it was long. It was a long time before obviously you actually started to see some results. I'm sure that it took you a while. Obviously you know depending on how much you play a day, uh, you know depending on how much you put in the time. That's going to depend on, you know, effort. You know, over, under, you know, I say I probably put in over uh, 300 hours on Madden 13. You know, it sounds like a lot, but when you love the game and when you when you actually, you know, physically just sit down and play it, you know, I mean, how many times have you uh, started playing some Madden and next thing you know it's, it's you know, like it's like 8 o'clock in the morning you got to get it to work because you stayed up Too all night playing times, the game. Man. <laughs> yeah, man. You know, I still... I still sometimes struggle, like literally like last uh, Friday night. So I, I had this uh, class, and I had stuff due in the class, and um, it was due Sunday. And I had all stuff going on all day Saturday, stuff going all morning Sunday, and so I was going to do the homework on Friday night. Well, then I got hit up to play a game. I played the game, and then I got logged up on a 
the auction block on Ultimate Team, trying to figure out if I'll ever be able to finally reach a 99 overall team. And uh, literally, it was next thing I knew, it was 4 o'clock in the morning. I had done no homework and ended up making for a very long day today. But uh, I guess the idea that I'm trying to get at, guys, is it's not undoable. It's not impossible. Uh, obviously, you need to have priorities. Obviously, we're not saying that Madden has to be your life. Uh, but we are saying that Madden has to be, uh, if you really want to be good, it has to be a substantial uh, time uh, time allotment for the game because uh, you really have to get into the game and work hard at it. Uh, but Tweezy, uh, I love talking, man. I, I love talking Madden with you. I love picking your brain. I'm, I'm sure we've gone longer than uh, we had both hoped. But uh, if you could do me one last favor, if you could just give, uh, if you had one thing, like if you if you sat down and, and you had this guy sitting down and this was going to be the last thing you ever told him about how to become the a top-level Madden player, uh, what would you say to him uh, and kind of where would you go with that conversation? Uh, I think the main thing that I would say to him is uh, it goes two ways. I think learning from your losses, and I think that's something that everybody says, but it's actually actually learning. Know why that guy just beat you. Know why you ran a cover three and he threw a fade against you, and he's usually catching all the way down the field. Know why he just did that. Don't just say, oh, this game's stupid. Tweezy just ran buck sweep on me every single play, and I didn't stop it, so obviously this game's broken. And then practice mode is your best friend. It is a chance for you to try anything that you want. Get two controllers... Don't just have one and have it a base coverage. Get two controllers and try and find a way to stop your offense. Figure out what somebody else could do to stop you and then make an adjustment. So I play, I'll run Buck Sweep against Trio Sky or 4-3 under Sam Sharp. I'll run it against that. And that's why it's been effective this year because I know exactly where I want to cut when I see Trio Sky come out. I know where I want to cut or I know the adjustments that I want to make. I need, I might need to motion somebody in to take away one of the pulling guards getting eaten and have him as, a, as somebody – running in front of me, or I might need to do a bunch of different adjustments. It's it's free. You can try a route against – It's you can try the fade route against a, a yellow route on the left and see if you can snag it on him real quick like I did against Beavers. And I got – he put he put his deep blue safety in a yellow, and he had him manned up. And I still knew that I was confident enough to throw that route and catch it and not get picked off or not have a catch tackle animation where I dropped it on a third, on a third and long. And that's yeah, something man. that you have to do. Yeah, definitely agree, man. Uh, I, I could, literally, man. I mean, I I wish we could just go back and like, literally, like just skip the question asking, and it only be you talking and me just like in the background, be like, yes, 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 <laughs> you know, because like literally, man, that, that's what it is. It, you know, it, it, that's, that's what it takes. Gosh, man, getting practice. Well, I'm so sick and tired of this. I'm 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 literally, you know, and it's not because we don't want to help. It's not. It's not that, guys. It's it's not. It, it is not that we don't want to help and give feed and give you resources to get better. But it's the fact of the matter. Because like it's like this. I love posting videos about Mad. I love talking about Mad. But what makes? But how can I actually help you get better? You have to do that. I can give you the best plays in the world. I can teach you. I could teach you verbatim what Tweezy did. He could tell you verbatim what he did. But the reality is what separates the Tweezies of the world uh, from the you know Johnny Averages from the world is the fact that the Tweezies of the world go into practice mode and they say, okay, what ha okay this beats two men under, but does it beat the cover three? Oh, okay, it beats the cover three. Now what happens if he starts adjusting? I need to know my weaknesses so that I can make them my strengths. And that's what makes Tweezy such a good player, and that's what makes all the good players such good players, is it's not necessarily that their plays are so groundbreaking. It's not necessarily that you know their reads are just flat-out crazy good. It's they've worked hard enough, and they know what's going to happen before it happens, and because of that, they set themselves up for success and make their weaknesses become a strength. But... Uh, uh, Tweezy, man, again, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Uh, at this point in the show, guys, we're about to close up here. Uh, but if there's anything that you are, uh, you know, kind of doing, uh, I know you said you stream a lot, uh, but that's probably going to die down a little bit. You're trying to, you know, get back in the lab and work harder and get ready for the new game. Uh, but if there's anything that you want to plug, anything that you're doing right now that you feel could 
you know, impact the community in some way, shape, or form, feel free to share, man. Yeah, so uh, like you said, I'm streaming. Um, it's mostly on the weekends now because I do have a job uh, during the week. Uh, I might start streaming during the week a little bit. I don't know. Just getting ready for this uh, My Head tournament in Orlando. Um, but it's twitch.tv slash bu underscore tweezy. Um, just same as my gamer tag if you guys ever want to hit me up on PlayStation. I've been taking a little less challengers now just because uh, the game's gotten a little less exciting for me in terms of head-to-head -head competition. But um, I'm sure I can squeeze in anybody for a game be before the game's uh, done and Mad 15 launches. Um, Twitter, at Trevor Boshin, uh, B-O-C-I-A-N is my last name. Um, you can hit me up on there if you guys have any questions. Um, and the last thing, uh, I already put out an ebook with one of my good friends. Uh, it's me, BZ. Uh, we put out a 4-6 ebook. If you guys ever tune in to, like, Slump City is a big streamer right now, and you'll see him. I'd like to think that he's winning a lot more games now than when he was calling cover three every play. That's you? Uh, huh? That's you? That's your defense? Yeah, that's, uh, that's our oh, force defense. Man, I, man I, I'm telling you what, man. It's like literally like in the last two weeks. I learned last week that Shopmaster was on Madden Nation. I learned today that – or I learned like four days ago who Slump was. And then I learned today that the reason that he's destroying people in Madden Ultra Team is because you put out that 4 or 6 guide. Man, that's great. Hey, guys, real quick, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, – it just popped in my head now after hearing you talk say that. Uh, I'm going to put a link to the ebook. You can check that out. Obviously, guys, you may, you may not want to spend money, but I'm telling you right now that – uh, no matter what the cause, I know just from talking to, to uh, Tweezy here, he knows the game. He's going to make you a better player. He knows next-gen Madden. I'd say he knows next-gen Madden better than anybody in the business right now. Talk to him. Hit him up. Check out this guide. Uh, I'm telling you right now, I guarantee you right now that this guide makes you better overnight, especially if you put the work in. So we'll have a link to that in the description below. Yeah, I just also want to put it out. I know it's uh, it's tough to show out money, especially because the game's kind of dying down this year, but we are doing a thing where we'll discount the next ebook that you buy for Madden 15, 50%. So if you put an investment now, you start learning some of the tips and tricks, then you buy that next ebook for however much is 50% prorated. Um, you'll have that fire coming out really early because we're gonna, it's going to be done very fast. I'm not going to get much sleep that first those first couple weeks. Um but, yeah, I just want to throw that out there because I know it's tough to want to buy an ebook this late in the year where there's a lot of stuff already out there. But we have some very, very unique stuff. We try to make it not anywhere close to what anybody else is running, but still make it effective. Yeah, man, that's great. That's great, man. I, again, like I said, I, I, can't, I can't thank you enough for taking this time out of your day, man. Uh, meeting you was uh, just a, a blessing in disguise, man. I had no idea uh, how, how knowledgeable you were. I mean, I knew you, you knew stuff, but... I love talking in depth. I love talking Madden, and I love this show, um, guys. Again, uh, we want to we want to thank Tweezy. We want to make him feel welcome to the community. Uh, so if you guys could just do me a favor, there will be a link to his Twitter uh, in the description. Remember, it's at Trevor Boshin. You can uh, just send him a thank you message for coming onto the show on Twitter. Uh, I know he'd appreciate it. Obviously, you can hit him up on PlayStation, uh, and I, I think that you guys would be doing yourself a big-time favor if you picked up his ebook. Uh, remember, uh, that will be in the description below as well. Uh, guys, thanks for listening to the podcast today. So that's pretty much it. I mean, that's the interview we did, and that is, I think, timeless. Uh, there's some things that we talk about, like buck sweeps, not necessarily the best run in the game anymore. Um, you know, different things like that, right? There's things like that that we can, you know, point to and say this is a little bit different now or whatever. But what I think you can take away from this is that there's a lot of stuff that cross applies. And, um, you know, what I really hope you can hear and pick up on and some of the little subtleties of the conversation is how important it is to execute, how important it is to adjust. And those things stay the same every Madden you play. And so um, if you guys are interested in this stuff, I'm looking to kind of start this back up. And um, if you have any names of people that you would like me to reach out to to interview on the show, go ahead and leave that in the comment section below. Also, if you guys want to get the free schemes, uh, just shoot me a text. My number is 812-216-3644. Thanks for watching this. I hope you enjoyed the video, and we'll see you guys on stream tonight at 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern.